welcome to another Health Essentials Podcast. I'm John Horton, your host. Why do some people on this planet live longer than others? It's a question that brought together researchers from around the world in the 1950s. Their goal in what became known as the Seven Countries Study was to explore possible connections between diet and heart disease. That project introduced us all to what's known as the Mediterranean diet. Today, we're going to look at that eating plan, which serves as the bedrock for heart-healthy living. Registered dietitian Julia Zumpano is here to walk us through the foods and the general rules of the Mediterranean diet. She's one of the many experts at Cleveland Clinic who pop into our weekly podcast just to help us live a little healthier. So with that, let's see what your heart desires for your next meal. Julia, welcome back to the podcast. Uh, Just uh, always a treat to have you on with us. Thank you so much for having me again, John. All right. So one of the things, and I know we've talked about this a lot, is is just the word diet. And and people hear it and they think it's some sort of short-term calorie cutting, got to lose some pounds to fit into an outfit thing. But it's it's much different than that in, in your world, right? Yeah. Well, it certainly can have that you know, description. Um, it can be a short term plan. A diet can be short term, but I like to look at it from a, a lifestyle, a lifestyle way of eating versus a diet. Um, a lot of people do feel that the, you know, the description that you provided about a diet is true. They, they think of it as a beginning and an end and they have a goal in mind. And once that goal is attained, the diet's done. Or if the goal is never attained, then the diet just kind of goes on the wayside, right? So they just kind of uh, start to incorporate their normal eating habits and all those properties are then lost. So I think that's where uh, we're doing um, false service to, you know, the American public and the nation about talking about diets that have these short-term benefits. We really need to talk about a lifestyle of eating. Um, I do feel that there are certain diets that need to be followed for certain short periods of time to gain um, a certain benefit, but then there's a lifestyle after that that needs to be maintained. Well, and that's what we're talking about today, the the ultimate uh, kind of lifestyle diet, uh, which is the Mediterranean diet. So before we get into a bunch of specifics as to what you eat on this plan, um, let's talk about why it's deemed so healthy and, and what kind of benefits you get out of it. Sure. So th- there's been several clinical studies um, proving the benefits of the Mediterranean diet. Um, so what it does, it looks at the countries around the Mediterranean. They did a seven country study and they looked at all these study, uh, all these countries and how they ate and, and noticed that there was a theme around the countries that lived around the Mediterranean Sea and that they ate very similar foods and they had a lot less health problems. Okay. Like what sort of health problems are we talking about then? So let's, let's kind of roll through um, some of the biggies there that it was going to help with cardiovascular disease. And then certainly they had some boost in, in longevity, right? So it's more longevity and, and heart disease related is what we found. So really more of a cardioprotective benefit to their style of eating. And then I saw other things, um, lower risk of dementia, uh, cancer risk down, uh, gut health, uh, weight control. I mean, all of that kind of gets tied into that form of eating. Yeah, it does because the Mediterranean diet has been lumped into more of like an anti-inflammatory diet as well. So when we talk about the properties of what a Mediterranean diet is, it's very similar to the properties of what can support the suppression of inflammation. And a lot of those disease states, if not all of them, are a byproduct of inflammation. Let's talk about inflammation for a minute, because I think in most people you think about inflammation and it's when you you sprain your ankle and, and it swells up. But I, the reality is that you have little bits of inflammation that go on all the time within your body when even if you just don't eat right or, or something happens. What what's going on there? Right. So there's uh, the inflammatory processes where you create chemicals in the body that are trying to fight off this inflammation, right? So your body's kind of fighting against this foreign form of of 
substance that might be in your body that's causing the inflammation, which we know there are tons of substances that cause inflammation in our, in our world, not from, from our diet and from our, the air we breathe and the products we put on our skin and the water that we drink. They can all create a, all levels of forms of toxicity in our body that then our body fights again. And, and that creates inflammation in our body, in our cells, in our inside our body, in our organs. And that inflammation eventually leads to disease. It, that's just such a, just a, a fascinating concept because you just don't think when you eat something, it's going to make your, your arteries like swell or, you know, some inflammation come in. But the, the truth is if you put garbage in your body, just it, that's how it reacts. Right. It's fighting to get it out. Right. So we want foods that it's only going to support its growth. It's going to support the cell protection. It's going to create those anti-inflammatory um, chemicals and enzymes and things to, to start working to suppress the inflammation and protect your cells, protect your organs, protect your entire system. All right. Well, let's talk about those foods because that was the next on our list as we were going to go through this. Um, if you're on the Mediterranean diet or, or that's how you're choosing to live, that's going to be your lifestyle choice. Uh, what sorts of food are you going to be putting on your plate? So foundationally, the Mediterranean diet has abundant amount of fruits and vegetables. So really that's kind of key. And we know that those all varieties of different fruits and vegetables have a variety of different antioxidants, phytochemicals, phytonutrients, some more than others, but they all provide some. And the variety is the key because you're going to get then a variety of those um, benefits. So fruits and vegetables for sure. So mix it up. You want a little color on your plate and that's uh, the fruits and vegetables all seem to add that little splash. Right. All different colors, all different varieties, trying something new. Every week is what I usually, you know, challenge my patients to do. Um, so we have fruits and vegetables, uh, grains. So if you are going to choose grains, they're whole grains, minimally processed, things like oats and quinoa, barley. So grains, brown or wild rice, avoiding any refined products. So refined flour based products. So white bread, white rice, crackers, pretzels, bakery items, et cetera. What, what, in, when you talk about like uh, whole grains versus those refined ones, what's happening in that process that makes the, the whole grain so much better than something that, that's a little more refined and been through the, the, the processing? Sure. So we know all those nutrients are found in the whole grain. Once we start to strip the outside layers of that grain, once we start to add chemicals to it, extract things from it, you know, fortify it, we're killing off all those wonderful properties that it already maintains. We know antioxidants can be killed by heat. So, you know, by, by making this wonderful grain being processed, we've pretty much killed all the nutritional benefit of it. And then we go and add it back in. That's what we call enriched flour because we've killed it off. It's just not as enriched as what you might think. No, <laughs> definitely not as enriched as what, what you think. Well, let's keep shopping. What else, what else should we uh, be looking for? So fish is a foundational source of protein in the Mediterranean diet. Um, again, it's very easy to have fish around the Mediterranean. It's the most abundant source of protein. So it is a little harder to, you know, instill that in, in, uh, in Ohio specifically, but when you don't live around um, a, a body of fresh water that's readily available. But um, so fish is the primary source of protein. Are, are there certain fishes you should look for? Yeah. So great question. Um, fish high in omega-3 um, have been shown to suppress that inflammation even further. So omega-3 fatty fish are things like salmon and herring, tuna, mackerel, um, sardines. So sea bass, those are good sources of omega-3. All fish can play a good role. Um, so could be good sources of protein. But if you're looking for specifically the fish high in omega-3 to suppress the inflammation, you want to go that route. Okay. And you said fish should be kind of the main protein in the Mediterranean diet, correct? Yeah, we recommend fish about three days a week, three meals a week of fish. What what should you use on those other uh, those other four days? So again, great question. Poultry, skinless poultry, 
would be um, the second preferred choice of protein. Um, and then getting your other sources of protein from plant-based sources like grains and beans and nuts are the other great sources of protein. So legumes are another foundational part of the Mediterranean diet. Legumes include dried beans and lentils. So any, any kind of bean, they all provide great benefit and, and variability here is again key. So using some beans to on a salad instead of putting meat on it or having a bean soup. Hummus is a great dip that has, you know, the properties of, of protein and fiber and the benefits of, of having legumes in your diet. Um, and then nuts, we know nuts are a, a definitely integral part of the Mediterranean diet. Uh, most of the nuts that are used in the Mediterranean are things like walnuts and almonds and hazelnuts. Um, th those are wonderful things to include on a regular basis, but if you don't favor those, all nuts can be included. What I just recommend is trying to incorporate the Mediterranean style nuts more often. So if you do favor more like peanuts or cashews, trying to mix in the other nuts is, is key. And then nuts are great, but you want to be careful with portion because uh, they can add up calories very quickly. Okay. Do they really add that much protein? Because it's, it's, it's almost hard to believe that, that you can substitute in legumes and, and nuts and, and, and have it be a, a full substitute for, for beef. Um, but I mean, it sounds like it, it can work that way. Um, it can. You have to look at portion and volume and what other foods you're eating. So, it, you know, when you look at volume, an ounce of meat has about seven grams of protein. You would have to eat a half a cup of beans to get that much protein. So volume by volume, it doesn't necessarily match. So you do have to eat more legumes to get in the amount of protein you would in, in beef or lean source of, of flesh meats or fish. But, um, you know, incorporating some of that plant protein in combination with eating things like fish and poultry, you certainly can meet your protein needs. Um, you can still eat egg whites and Greek yogurt. Those are great sources of protein as well. So it's just a matter of getting a good variety sources of protein and noting the fact that although beans and legumes may not, not be as high in protein when you compare volume as meat, but they have a lot of other benefits that the meat may not have. Okay. And, you know, since we're talking about meat and you had mentioned eggs and dairy and things like that, I mean, those are obviously really big items for, in a lot of people's, uh, on, on their shopping list. Um, is there a place for those within the Mediterranean diet? Yes, absolutely. So things like yogurt, um, is, it can be encouraged daily on the Mediterranean diet. We do suggest more of like a Greek style yogurt or plain yogurt. So something that's not packed with a lot of sugar. Um, lower fat varieties, so skim or 0% fat, 1% or 2% fat would be fine. So you just want to avoid the full fat varieties of that. But yeah, yogurt and milk is, is acceptable. Um, again, in moderation. Cheese is the one that uh, I think we really encourage um, limitation. So cheese, the recommendation on the Mediterranean diet is about three to four ounces of cheese a week. So that does not come out to be a lot. Most people eat about three to four ounces of cheese a day. So we want to avoid all processed cheeses, again, because they are not you know, leading us to healthy outcomes. Then we want to choose more mild or lighter cheeses, something like a feta cheese or a fresh mozzarella, a ricotta or goat cheese, very, very light cheeses. Um, and then again, still limiting the portion of that. What about like baked goods and things like that? Since we all do, you know, we like to delve into that every so often. Um, is there room for, for that in there also? Sure. So commercial baked goods are avoided. So there's really not much room for commercial baked goods. Special occasions, once a year, fine. But on a regular weekly basis, no. Um, but if you want something baked, it is encouraged you bake at home. So you can adjust and include healthier ingredients. So certainly you can make a banana bread or, you know, some um, cookies or something with the acceptable ingredients. So using things like whole grain flour, um, you know, healthier oils, using more like egg whites, 
you're reducing the sugar, maybe using honey or using some fruit to sweeten. So making adjustments to help that baked good be um, more nutrient dense. You had mentioned the healthier oils too. I take it, it, it seems like the one that always comes up with the Mediterranean diet is olive oil. Uh, what's so magical about that? Yeah, so um, and olive oil has a ton of um, antioxidant properties. So we know antioxidants protect our cells from damage. So that can really help, you know, suppress things like cancer and heart disease, et cetera. Um, and then there's a lot of um, polyphenols in olive oil that has been shown to be protective from a cholesterol standpoint, a blood pressure standpoint, a lot of proven benefits to extra virgin olive oil. Um, and, you know, one thing that commonly comes up when you're following a diet or an eating plan is that it can be bland. So, you know, in the Mediterranean, they use olive oil very freely and very generously. And it does provide a lot of great flavor to the food that they're eating. And we found that even though they're using it so generously, there have not been negative health benefits. Oh, wow. So that's another really key factor of the Mediterranean diet. If we found that this kind of oil that adds so much flavor to our foods can't, it doesn't have negative health outcomes where we've always kind of focused on low fat when it comes to heart health. And it's very refreshing to know that we don't necessarily need to focus on that when using olive oil, extra virgin olive oil. You know, just just going through this whole list with you, I, what what really strikes me is just how um, how accessible all these foods are. I mean, th this isn't some kind of wild exotic list of, of of items that you need to go get. These are all things that you know we're familiar with that you see that you probably buy when you're out. But it's just a matter. It sounds like on, on focusing on eating them a little more and putting together certain plates. Absolutely, I think that's what is the saving grace of the Mediterranean diet. It's why people can follow it for so many, you know, centuries and decades of families following this style of eating is because it really just does focus on whole foods that we all know, we all see, they're accessible to everyone. You know, some some fish may be less accessible to some people than others, but you really just, you know, just seafood in general is accessible to most people, right? Poultry is accessible to most people. Nuts, all of these things are so accessible. And there's so much variety within each category of the food that you can find something you enjoy in each category and kind of start there and then start to kind of get a little bit more adventurous and starting to try different types of, of fish or, or vegetables or fruit or grains or whatever it might be. But, you know, there's almost something that everyone can enjoy in each category. And really, it just focuses on filling up your diet and your plate with these single ingredient foods that have so much nutritional benefit and really decreasing all the junk and snack foods that we're eating. It just seems more natural. And, and, and it's, it's not going to rule out a ton of different stuff other than, like you said, that really processed just the stuff that we know deep down is probably bad for us. Sure, sure. And, and, you know, red meat can be included in moderation in the Mediterranean diet. So we usually recommend red meat only about one meal a week. And that red meat is classified as beef, pork, veal, and lamb. Now, if you have, you know, pretty progressive heart disease, I'd say probably consume less than that. But if you're just kind of protecting your heart and doing it for overall heart health, um, red meat can be included in moderation. Well, Julia, we always on this podcast, one of the things we pride ourselves on are, are giving people some kind of actionable tips that they can use um, if they want to kind of follow the Mediterranean diet and, and, and take this advice. So what sort of adjustments would you have to make or what sort of tips would you give someone who wanted to start on this eating plan? So I would start with trying to incorporate a fruit or a vegetable with every meal. And that would be the first step. So every time you sit down, see if you have a fruit or a vegetable and ideally progressing to having one of each. And I take it people don't do that enough. I mean, that's what you must see as a dietitian, I'd imagine. Yeah, that is one of the biggest problems. It's just an adequate intake of vegetables more so than fruit, but both are fairly inadequate. 
So that would be a very good first step. And then seeing, you know, finding which of those fruits and vegetables you enjoy and continuing to consume, consume them throughout the day, multiple times a day. And the hope is that you eventually start to decrease the amount of refined grain and, and you know, processed protein or, or meats that you're eating and then incorporate more into, you know, fresh meats and fish and then, you know, minimally processed grains. When eating more of those vegetables too, I'd imagine uh, during the day, I mean, they're, they're, they're filling. So that will help just with the, the desire to binge snack and, and reach for those chips and the pretzels and, and all the other things that we just kind of grab when you get the grum bellies around three o'clock. Absolutely. I think that's one of the biggest pitfalls that most people fall into is that they are hungry and they tend to grab a snack food that's not going to fill them, not going to provide them nutrition, any nutrition, but going to provide them with a ton of extra calories, a ton of extra fat, a ton of extra sodium that's not leading to their health goals, whether it be lowering your blood pressure, cholesterol, or losing weight. So we're, we're getting in a habit of just grabbing the wrong food instead of filling our, our day with fruits and vegetables, which can be so much more filling, so much more satisfying, provide so many more nutrients and antioxidants that are just going to support the whole picture. Not to mention the fact that they're extremely low in calories, low in, if in any, sodium, low in fat, if any fat, and, and naturally have natural sugars, no added sugars. So, so many benefits there. So that would be really the integral first step would be incorporating a fruit and a vegetable with every meal. What about as far as like, I hate to say, getting used to fish? I know a lot of people, people have some strong opinions on, on eating fish. Um, how do you kind of get past that? So th that is a tough one to get past. So I generally recommend starting with a very mild fish, a very, very mild fish, and maybe starting um, at a restaurant, like when you're going out to eat, you know, usually that's, it's usually prepared the best way. Um, so trying that, maybe incorporating fish more when you're eating out, and then trying to find what kind of fish you like and how you like it prepared, and then experimenting a little bit there at home. Um, starting with whatever fish you already know you do like, whether it's shellfish or whitefish or salmon, whatever it is, just trying to incorporate that on a regular basis. Even canned tuna can be included. So you just want to be careful with like sodium and mercury, but there's um, certainly ways around that when you're purchasing canned tuna. But um, that's another great way to get, just kind of get your feet wet. Um, don't look at it from, okay, all of a sudden I have to make fish my primary source of protein. That's, I think, the worst way of looking at it. We want to just start slowly. Let me try to have fish, um, you know, every Friday. Let's start there. And I'm going to try different kinds and see what I like. And I would encourage that with like fruits and vegetables. That's why I said try to add one or the other each time you eat and then eventually progress. And this all seems to go back to the, the very first thing we were talking about, which is the, the concept of a diet as not a like you know a, a forced eating style for for this time, but as a lifestyle and, and kind of a lot of different choices. But you're just kind of making them in a in a big picture sort of way. Yeah, and I I really think that you know when you try something once and you don't like it, I think you should definitely give it another try. So fish can be tough. Sometimes it can be prepared and you know, not prepared prepared properly or wasn't stored properly. So it can have that fishy taste that can really turn people off. Um, and you know, if that's happened to me, I have definitely had a, a piece of fish. I'm like, Oh, I'm going to give a fish a break for a little bit. Um, and, and that's okay, but just going back to it and trying again. And I would say that again, with anything new that you try, whether it's hummus or a quinoa or a different kind of vegetable or fruit or someone that you don't like, just again, keeping a very open mind and trying it again or trying it a different kind or a new way of preparing it and seeing if you can incorporate it more regularly and finding a way that you can enjoy it. Because the key is to find enjoyment out of food. No one wants to be told to eat a bunch of foods that they don't enjoy. That's never going to be sustainable and it's not realistic. 
So you really want to, there's so much variety and so many options in the Mediterranean diet. It's just a matter of finding what you like as a part of the Mediterranean diet and instilling those on a regular basis. When we're talking about fish too, I take it we should try to stay away from fried fish. There, there's other ways to prepare it that we need to uh, need to look at there. Yeah, definitely deep fried and breaded fish you want to try to avoid. Deep fried never seems to be the healthy answer to anything. So <laughs> No, but I do think that there's something to be said on with for a pan fried fish. I think it adds a nice crispy flavor on the outside. Um, just, you know, really minimizing, you don't want to cook in high levels of heat with extra virgin olive oil anyhow. So you'd have to use more of a refined olive oil if you're going to cook on, in a pan in high heat. But I usually say turn the heat down, use the least amount of oil you can, kind of coat the pan and put a lid, you know, and just kind of kind of get that crispiness without over frying or over cooking it. So I think, you know, using a little bit of pan frying is totally acceptable if you even want to bread it, there's, you know, some whole grain breadcrumbs you can use. Some people use flax seeds. There's ground up like almond flour you can use to bread it. Like there's certainly ways that you can incorporate some of that flavor without, you know, having the full, full fledged typical, you know, deep fried breaded fish. You can try to make it at home. And I say that for anything in the Mediterranean diet. And that's where that baked goods comes in, you know, like, you know, that full store-bought, you know, pound cake, you can try to find something that you can make at home that can give you that same benefit and pleasure without having so many un unhealthy ingredients in there. See, this is what's so great. The Mediterranean diet seems like it offers just about everything you would want. You just, you have to look for different ways to get it and, and then just kind of experiment, um, experiment with the food and have some fun while you're doing it. Yeah, definitely experiment with it. Um, and it is more fun if you do it with a group or with a partner. So, you know, trying to, to navigate this on your own can be challenging. So if you can recruit a family member or friend or, you know, try to uh, see, you know, how you can incorporate this in, in your um, social network too can be really helpful. And then you can bounce ideas off and, and um, re share recipes that can be really helpful too. Well, you have certainly filled our plate with just a, a ton of uh, healthful information today. Um, anything else you'd like to add about the Mediterranean diet? Not really. Just knowing that it's it has so many be positive benefits that any small step towards the Mediterranean diet is a step in the right direction. All right. Well, that sums it up perfectly. Julia, thank you so much for being here and uh, can't wait uh, for you to come back. Thank you so much for having me. There's a reason why the Mediterranean diet grabs so much attention. It works. Decades of research show how this eating plan can help you live longer and healthier. So give it a try. Your heart will love you for it. Till next time, be well.